individuals uh, working on the back end to uh, uh, monitor the chat and respond to that. So feel free if we're not responding to you or if we have if you raise your hand and we haven't responded, come off your mute off mute and say, hey, whoever, you know, I've got a question and we'll address that as we move forward. Again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Let's go to the next slide. It's kind of talking about the agenda for today. Uh, legislative requirement for October 1 submission with no extensions, legislative requirement for staff email reminders, teacher data announcement, district of residence and address validation updates, Utah fits all scholarships, special education updates, um, updating um, graduation rates for cohort 2024, and then our October 1 Utrex submission training. It is a, a full agenda. So let's if we're ready, let's go to the next slide. I believe I have the next number of these. So you should all be aware. And if you're not, um, just a reminder here that um, there is a legislative change where we have to submit all of our uh, enrollment counts to the legislature um, and the governor's office on October 15th, which means uh, there is no extension possibilities um, for the October 1. Uh, what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequence number one is if you are short um, on the enrollments that could have financial impacts. Um, there are other impacts that uh, we hope we don't have to face, but those are, are things such as uh, other programs, such as the E-rate, um, the, there could be impact on that one a little bit. I'm sure that we could do adjustments. We, we've tried to do some behind the scenes planning just in case um, something goes wrong. Again, we're not assuming things will go wrong, but just in case information is off, um, we would probably be uh, implementing our backup plan. So I just want to share, make sure that one, you are all aware uh, the submission deadline will be uh, Monday. October 7th, um, obviously the state board will have all hands on staff that day working um, that day to make sure um, the information is sent. Usually we like to make sure, you know, it's basically five o'clock that uh, we require that information be sent. So make sure that's on your calendar. We're ready to go. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach back to us. But at the same time, um, recommend that you let other individuals within your agency um, also know that there's no extensions. Um, emails have been sent out to superintendents and to uh, charter directors um, and to the um, business administrators from uh, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones about the seriousness of getting the, this count correct and just the timing behind it. So there's that one. Let's go ahead to the next slide. And the next one, okay. Well, go back one. This is just a final reminder that you, um, we have a new requirement this year and it's gonna be ongoing um, that all staff emails need to be submitted to the state, uh, which then will be shared with the legislature and with the governor's office um, that they can utilize and um, also USBE could utilize up to three times a year to send out information uh, to all educators. The due date for this is September 30th. That is the last day. I mean, it is due on the, the uh, October um, 1st that we need to be working with this. We've sent out an email uh, multiple times reminding you about this. Um, our first, if you will, harder deadline um, is tomorrow, um, end of day. Uh, we'll be reviewing everyone who is uh, hasn't submitted yet on that information, um, which would basically give us a week. I will take those names of the LEAs and communicate that with uh, Superintendent Sid Dixon and Scott Jones, let them know of that, um, that uh, we have not received the information from these LEAs, and then um, basically have that next week and a day for uh, you guys to hurry and get that information sent in to us. Um, there are possibilities that uh, if you don't submit it, that um, 
there could be some financial consequences. Again, this is more um, in line with uh, what the superintendent and, and her deputies want to do moving forward with that. So just being letting you be aware again of uh, who this information is going to. The question I see that dropped into the chat was who sent this data request originally and then jumping over. How do we update the staff emails that were originally sent? Um, you can submit again if you need to. Please let us know that you can send me an email and Nicole Clark so we know which one to pull from that. So that was the first question. How do we update the staff list? Um, and two, has staff changed? How do we make those changes? The answer is we don't. Once we get that final submission in um, and then uh, after that, that's what the it will be set as for the year. Um, we're not planning uh, for changes after that. Again, we have this, this conversation internally, also with the legislature saying, you know, expectation, is this supposed to be alive? Is this a capture with a, a date? How do we want to approach that? They set it on the date. And so after that date, uh, that's done. Um, Sarah says, who sent this date, this data originally? Um, Sarah, can you come off? mute and clarify what you mean by that? Yes, I'm, I'm just curious because I don't think I've seen this at all. So I'm just wondering who was sent this information originally to update. So this was sent basically to everyone here. Um, last year, we did a survey saying who has this information we sent out to this group. So if you didn't receive it, um, let us know. Um, actually, send an email to Nicole Clark and have her check to see if you guys have submitted it or not. What happened was the email came to you with instructions saying, if this is you, here's your link to go um, submit this information else, please pass this on to like your HR or your um, uh, maybe your uh, business administrator, whoever, and have them fill that out. So um, following up, is this for all staff or those who just um, just need to receive Utrex updates. This is for all staff. Basically, again, sharing with what Jerry said, your question there is, this is everyone that is employed by your LEA that you generate an email for. Um, and then Stephen's uh, question, do you need anything besides just the email address itself? Um, the answer is within that email request or the Qualtrics form itself. Okay, it, it spells out exactly what we, we need in there, but basically it's just the uh, email address. Um, Nicole, do you wanna respond to the exact needs of what's in the file that's being requested? I don't know if she's able to answer. Let's see if Nicole is able to answer that or not. Um, Nicole, if you want to drop the answer in the chat, I appreciate that. Um, and then we'll we'll we will be reaching out um, to the individuals directly who we have not received anything from. So just be aware uh, we are tracking which LEAs we've received and which one we haven't. By the way, majority we um, have sent it in. We checked this. Well, I checked it last week. Uh, we had maybe um, uh, two quarters of, of everyone had submitted this information. So any other questions other than what what's the exact elements? Uh, New Ames was not part of this group until this year. Can you restate the person to check with? Um, again, this is... This is going to Don. This is for everyone who was on the Utrex on this uh, invite uh, list serve that we have with your email. So that's who it was sent out to. So if you feel like you did not receive it, feel free to email Nicole Clark. Um, Nicole, will you drop your email in the chat? Okay. Thank you. Let's move to the next slide. And one more. Go ahead, Kristen. Hello, everybody. Um, 
I welcome to the few teacher data announcements because you know legislature loves student data early. They also want teacher data early. You can go to the next slide. Legislative salary adjustment has been changed from November 15th to October 13th, which is a Sunday, so it'll be October 14th. Um, you have to have your educators in and they have to have a current license and a qualifying assignment to get this funding. This is the biggest funding piece we send out per teacher. It's at almost 10K a teacher um, who's full-time. So you need to get this in. If the teacher does not have a current license, you need to have the request for an LEA specific license in by October 1 to guarantee funding. We will continue to process them, but we cannot guarantee that we'll get through them if they come in after that. Um, and to get to get the, uh, if the, the educator does not have a license, they need to have done ethics within the last year and have a current cleared background. Um, are there any questions about this? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> So Cliff, you prepared the uh, PowerPoint. Are you ready to take this? Yeah, definitely. Okay, turn it over to Cliff. Thank you. All right, uh, go ahead and start us out with the next slide. All right, so an update on where we're at for the District of Residence um, updates, the validations that we've been talking about for um, coming on about six months now. Uh, what we've got for our October finalization for this year, uh, first I've got the dates there for reference, and I've also got the October finalizer guidance link there for reference. Um, a note on that, that there is a, a pending update that's just getting published uh, any time here. Uh, that this should be available uh, with all the updates that you know we're talking about today. Uh, but the areas that we are talking about for district of residence, we've got the GPS latitude, GPS longitude, and geocode fields that were SISs. Those are available fields now uh, for the October finalizing. We also have the physical address line one that we had set up previously that was additionally looking for being able to use a GPS longitude, latitude, or a geocode. So in case an SIS wasn't able to get those other three fields added in time, uh, we did maintain that as available for the physical address line one. Um, once we do get to a state where everybody has gotten that set up with their SIS, uh, then we'll decommission out the logic that's trying to use that physical address line one um, as we'll have the preferred method in place for everyone. Um, and a note, uh, we have talked about the geocode, which is a Google Plus code in the past, and the hope to be able to bring that out for compatibility for a short code. Um, that's not currently in our, our game plan right now, uh, so we are still requiring for the full long code. Um, you can reach out to me directly with any questions about that. Um, it's like we've already got a question here. Um, I'll take a break and try to jump in and help with it. Um, Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, so just to make sure I understand, when you say physical line, address line one is an additional temporary method, you mean the temp we can temporarily put the GPS coordinates into that field and then... Sure. Is there an expectation that we will eventually have a GPS coordinate for every single person? Or if if we know their physical address, are we good to just submit that and leave the GPS coordinates blank indefinitely? Yes, um, you are good to leave a valid working address um, as it is without having to do additional steps. So we're we're not necessarily aiming to try to get these values for everyone. Our primary intent is to make sure that for addresses, which are the best that we can get, but 
can't really meet those abilities to get a lookup and be able to come back and find your district of residence that we're using these additional pieces to try to help get to that because that's um, the end goal is for all of this to be able to provide that district of residence for every student where um, that is required for uh, funding and a lot of auditing things that the state goes through um, and that um, helps support everybody, really the LEAs, the students, uh, the state, uh, by actually being able to have that credible data. So, uh, also the students in the programs that they get access to, which I've talked about in the past. One of the primary ones is the child nutrition program. Um, but that one we can get by with the mailing address for as an alternative, um, which doesn't get us past still needing to have um, that physical address or a GPS or a plus code, as we do still need to be able to validate a physical address um, outside of the you know, mailing address for things like the child nutrition. So continuing on, we've got uh, the level one district of residence validation warning. The S1368 is now a non-loading error. Um, I've given the details here for which one that one specifically is. Um, and again, level one errors are the ones which check just directly against your system to make sure uh, that things are looking right. Uh, so we've got a must be present um, error in place here uh, for that district of residence error and the details involved with that and the exclusions. So the exclusions being that if the student's from another state, um, then it's not going to be an error. So we don't have any problems with that. We're not asking for district of residence for those students. Um, Riley's giving out great details here on the uh, chat uh, to correspond with uh, extra details on this. Um, and as always, uh, please continue to reference our uh, greenhouse guide for any areas that you have questions on for errors. Uh, we are still uh, looking to make sure that this is as bulletproof as we can um, and that we're looking to get feedback which I'm going to have on uh, a later slide here. Uh, but we are doing updates still. And if it's not perfect yet, uh, we are hard at work to make it that way. So uh, continue to give us the feedback. Um, I think that our last update was as of yesterday, um, in which case we saw, I think it was something like a 90% reduction on one of our LEAs that we're sending in uh, the geocode, um, but still getting um, an error. Uh, but we've resolved that uh, to where that's again down to, I think, two errors in this LEA's instance. So our accuracy, accuracy level is now where we're hoping it to be. So please bring us your instances uh, to where we can help you with them. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, so how does all of this work? This is um, a little bit complex. Uh, I'm trying to give a bit of a representation that hopefully doesn't come across as complex as it technically is behind the scenes. Um, first off, when we get the student record, we're going through our level one address validations, which like I said, they're pretty straightforward of, is it there, not null? Um, is it within the character limits? you know, that you didn't send something that's a, you know, chapter long. Um, and that the physical address line one is a little bit unique in that it can have one of any of those values in it. It could have an address, a GPS coordinate, or a geocode. So just trying to make sure that it's clear that that's still allowed and the address line, uh, the level one address checks will still allow for that. Optionally, if you provide us the GPS latitude and longitude and the geocode, then we're going to move that along into our level two validations. And the first thing that we check, uh, because it's the most precise thing that we assume is only going to be used when um, the other addresses aren't working, uh, is we're going to check for that latitude and longitude 
and then the geocode in that order to see if that student is within that district of residence. So if you've got a student where their address isn't working well, this is where we'd want you to give us that latitude and longitude uh, that shows that they're physically within the boundaries of that district of residence. This check will check that first off. It'll return it back and say that they were in it. Or if the latitude and longitude don't match, then right off the bat, it's going to return out and say that they're not within the district of residence. So this is kind of a first in value set uh, that's searchable, and then it's going to return the result from it. So if we don't get that, we'll move on to the geocode. If we don't get the geocode, then we'll move on to checking the physical address line one for those same types of things to see if that has those values in it. Uh, and if the GPS is in there, we'll take that and we'll evaluate if it's within the boundaries. And then if uh, it's not, then we'll return out again that it wasn't within the boundaries. Uh, so it doesn't check each and every one of them, it does the first one out. Uh, the geocode, same scenario of if you give us a geocode in the physical address line one, we'll check that and see if it's within the boundaries. Uh, last of all, the one that is the standard for most uh, is going to be just using the physical address line as a physical address, as your street address. And if that still doesn't uh, give us a value uh, that's within the boundaries, then we're going to be triggering that warning message as it is now uh, that we had previously talked about trying to bring to a non-loading error for this October uh, finalizing period. Uh, so this is a step back on that, that we realize that we still have efforts to work through with you and to make sure that we've got the level of accuracy, that everyone can feel safe and trust that their students are going to be loaded. So uh, we're pulling back on making that non-loading. So hopefully that puts some of you at ease that we're going to keep these as warnings um, at minimum for uh, this October. Um, potentially again for December. Um, and until we get to a level where we're able to communicate with you and get a confidence level with you that we've been able to address all these concerns, um, you know, we're not going to, you know, switch that over to non-loading. And you'll hear about it here from these meetings before we do so. So let me check and see if we've got any um, concerns or comments out here yet. Um, are we getting the physical address information from the Utah GRC and, and can we check their API? Uh, so that is a yes. The, we are getting it from the Utah GRC uh, where we're checking it for the district of residence. And that you can also check that same API. Uh, it's uh, free access. So uh, if you want to sit, shoot me out an email, um, I can connect you up with our technical team that can give you directions um, and also connect you up with somebody from the Utah GRC uh, to assist you with being able to do those same checks that we're doing. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. All right, so as I mentioned before, uh, we're eager for feedback. Uh, we're analyzing the results, we're finding improvements, we're making improvements on our side. And I'm sure any of you that have been sending in the data and seeing things coming through not fixed, um, hopefully this is encouraging for you because uh, it is getting better and getting better quickly. So please check your results today and, and give us that feedback. Because, um, again, we understand the reliability of these validations and that funding is affected from it, and we're not going to uh, risk the students or your funding um, at this stage. All right. Um, any last questions before we move past this? All right. Go ahead to the next slide. Actually, uh, Cliff, can I yeah, um, sure. interrupt? So I think you had mentioned that, um, you know, the 
invalid, the level two invalid address and level two invalid district of residence would be warnings for this October and potentially through December. Um, at the beginning of the month, we had sent an email out to LEA saying that it would be warnings at the December. Um, so just to ensure that that's clear that they will still be warnings, not potentially warnings, but they will be warnings in December. All of our game plans are that's still going to be a warning. Um, okay, and great. Thank you. Unless you guys like are outstanding and you knock it out of the park and and you're able to tell us, you know, all's well. Um, our plan is to keep things well and to keep that as a warning. All right. So uh, moving on, there's been a lot of questions about the Utah Fits for All scholarship and the involvement. Uh, with USBE, um, even though it's not a USBE program, um, a lot of uh, LEAs uh, districts have been uh, set up as providers with Utah Fits for All Scholarship. So that's introduced a lot of questions, and I'll be trying to go through some of those and help you guys out with uh, that. And if you've got any questions I don't hit, by all means, you know, shoot them to me directly or bring them up here. Uh, go ahead with the next slide. So the first one I've got is a UFA provider uh, question for the Utrex use. Can I send UFA data on the Utrex collections? And that's a no. Um, data collections uh, with Utrex, they will not accept UFA enrollments, students, courses, or outcomes. We don't have failures built in that, you know, detect and will cause all these things to immediately reject out. So a lot of this is uh, a co-responsibility here for any of those providers that that information um, is not to be sent and it's erroneous and outside of, you know, the legislation for us to be receiving it through this. So no student records. Um, an exclusion for that would be that the S1 record where you're exiting a student, uh, that's absolutely normal to be sent for a student that's leaving public school. Um, and that would be completely normal uh, for you to send and that you would send them with an exit code of either a transfer to private school or a transfer to homeschool. Uh, we also won't be receiving any transcript records for UFA courses. So students that are involved in this, um, it's completely outside of transcripts. Uh, and you would not send those. Uh, the courses or the course membership data, um, again, uh, that would not be coming to us through Utrex or your data collections. Go to the next screen. Um, additional UFA provider question on the SIS and Utrex. Can I load UFA student data into my current SIS? And that's a yes, but only if the access to the data is restricted to users with a need to know the information. So we still have a lot of privacy um, concerns here that need to be ensured with all these providers that this is a completely separate system of data. These students are not a part of the district. They're not a part of um, any of the other districts reporting or classes, uh, the teachers, anybody involved with this. It's a completely separate scenario. Um, and I've got the UFA courses, students, enrollments, teachers, outcomes, all must not be visible to a non-UFA awarded student, parent, or non-UFA teachers. So that may be a change uh, for some of the systems where people have already been working with this. And if you do have these problems where this isn't compliant yet, please reach out to us and we will help you with addressing that to make sure that we're, again, protecting the privacy of these students as quickly as possible. Um, the UFA students are not allowed part-time enrollment in public school whatsoever. 
So um, that was something that was potentially open uh, early on with the UFA conversations where there could be a part-time scenario, just to make sure that's completely clear. If you're enrolled in UFA, uh, you cannot be also enrolled in public school at the same time. Uh, UFA data may not be included in any non-UFA centric reports. UFA students utilizing providers that are also a public LEA are not entitled to programs not also available to private school or homeschool students not attending the LEA. So uh, that's a bit of a complex roundup there on those words. So essentially saying that if a UFA student that's um, involved with a provider that is an LEA, uh, there's no difference between that student and a student which is um, not enrolled uh, at uh, a UFA provider course uh, from that same LEA. So uh, they don't get any extra treatment just because uh, say uh, that district is also a provider. Um, as a UFA provider, the organization is not an agent of the state. All right, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, UFA students and assessments. Uh, can UFA students still request assessments? And that's yes. The same right and means for requesting assessments that are already in place for private homeschool students is also in place uh, for any UFA student, um, all students in Utah. Uh, the parent and guardian would contact the student's district of residence uh, for that request, um, and then they would be able to assist with getting those assessments. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, UFA students uh, re-entering public school. So can UFA students re-enter public schools? And that's again, yes. At any point, a UFA student can exit from UFA and return to public school. Um, there are no restrictions, no determinations of you know, funds used or the time or duration of when that occurs. Um, it's open entry to come back to a public school. Uh, at any point, uh, thank you. So I would say at any point would mean um, during the eligibility period where they're still an eligible student. So uh, not insinuating um, any point in time, but during a school year and while they're still eligible uh, for the public school uh, due to age and things like that. Does that clarify? Uh, enough for you on that, or do you have any other additional questions? So once they've accepted the scholarship, um, they have to be unenrolled from public school. And once they've then uh, exited UFA, they can come back to public school, regardless again of what point in time in the school year that is. So if they attended for a week, at UFA, they could still come back to public school. If it was the last week of school, um, they could still exit and come back to public school. Uh, there aren't any restrictions. Uh, they're in place that would prevent that nature from happening. Um, how would we know if they've exited? Um, I would say that's a, a good question from the parent guardian. Um, you would uh, be able to, you know, just inquire of where they were at previously. Um, if they uh, it indicated that they were a UFA student and that they had exited, um, you can reach out and contact UFA for a confirmation um, that they have exited. Uh, we do have systems in place where UFA does share their roster data with us to cross-check to make sure that there are not um, dual enrolled students, um, that we provide that access to um, the roster data for them to validate that with. 
All right. Uh, so will this somehow be listed somewhere like Data Gateway? And that's uh, no. Um, that uh, if a student is detected as being um, UFA and public school at the same time, our communication is just between us and UFA to be able to resolve that. Um, as far as if there are conflicts uh, and you've got a parent um, which is interested in getting those resolved, um, you can reach out to myself and I can uh, help coordinate any concerns uh, with UFA um, to try to get those details back for you. Uh, we do have uh, API connections which are uh, being built out uh, with UFA for fast results to where we're able to, again, validate if they have left. Um, and our improvements on that, you know, should continue to grow throughout the year uh, on that communication. But right now, I would say just reach out to myself and I can try to help get you in contact with uh, anyone that will help us resolve this. Uh, what if the parents aren't honest with us? Uh, that is a part of what we have for our checks in the system. So if you did enroll a student that was still enrolled in UFA, um, it would trigger validations that both they're checking um, and that the state also has access to be able to help validate as well to, uh, to be able to return and start a suspension of their account. So that's the initial step that happens if there is a dual enrollment found is that they go into a suspension um, until that can be resolved. Um, so as far as it showing up on both sides, um, I can say both sides being that uh, USBE and UFA and there's also involvement with uh, SOEP seats, Carson Smith uh, and Children's First. Uh, across the board, uh, we're all looking at that enrollment to be able to determine whether or not they're only involved in the one program and if there are any dual enrollments. And we do again have that uh, mitigation uh, process that we're in development on right now uh, to refine and make sure that we are contacting uh, parents quickly and getting these addressed. And there could be reaching out to LEAs uh, involved with that as well, too. Um, does any funding come back to the district if a UFA student came back to school um, in November or December? Um, I would think that that would just apply essentially the same way uh, as far as with a uh, LEA receiving funding if any public or homeschool student were to start up uh, in those same time frames. Um, there shouldn't be a difference as far as how that student is counted um, and financials are in place for the LEA. Does that answer that question? Great, thank you. All right, uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, output from UFA courses. This has been another common question of um, when the student is taking the course, uh, who gets to know about the output? And the easy answer on this is that it's only the student and the parent guardian. Uh, that output is not provided to UFA. That output is not provided to USBE. As I mentioned before, the transcripts or to the US Department of Education or any other agency. Um, it's strictly between the parent, student, and that's it. Uh, and of course, the provider themselves. Uh, there would not be any collections or any output from a provider to UFA. All right, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so for references on all of this, um, I've tried to provide some of the direct links 
uh, for some of the code which is out for this. Uh, a quick summary uh, for anyone who's not familiar and just trying to get caught up on what the Utah Fits for All Scholarship is. Um, an outline there about how it's uh, a scholarship for the $8,000 for Utah K through 12 students. Um, and that the accounts uh, can be used or for allowable education expenses and services, including but not limited to private school tuition fees, tutoring services, testing fees, materials, curriculum costs, and contracted services. Um, I've also outlined a few of the direct links for uh, providers, which should help with what your uh, details are for what legislation requires of you um, and those two call outs there for the code. And I've also provided the link directly for the UFA uh, scholarship uh, program. So they can also give you more direct information. Right. Uh, if there isn't any other questions, uh, I think that was the end of what I have for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so this is my yearly special education event dropout presentation. Um, hopefully a lot of this is just a reminder for a lot of you. Um, but feel free to ask any questions or reach out to me if you need more information. Next slide, please. Okay, so the special ed, special ed event dropouts, there's a report in the data gateway that shows students age 14 through 21 who are currently um, gonna count as a dropout for the OSEP indicator two, and also they would be a dropout in, in the event dropout rate. But in that report, it when you open it up, it lists the students, and then there's a column that lists the dropout type. And that column tells you why the student is being identified as a dropout. And that helps you determine next steps in following up. So there's going to be three different values in that field. And it'll say either high school completion status, exit code, or summer dropout. Next slide, please. So if the student is identified as a dropout because of either the high school completion status code or the exit code, uh, that means that last year they exited school in a way that they, that they were a dropout. Um, and so that for those students, we often get questions um, if the student does return to school in the next year, oh, this student returned to school, why are they still showing up as a dropout? So for those students, it's because the returning to school isn't, doesn't make them, doesn't change the fact that the way they exited last year was as a dropout. Um, so for that one, it, it'll say high school completion status code. If the, if it's one of the, it's, it, it's the GP or the DO codes in high school completion status that end up being a dropout. And then if high school completion status is blank that you didn't submit a high school completion status code for the student, then we look at the exit code. And there's a few more exit codes that count as dropouts. We have the DO, WD, uh, transfer to adult ed, um, and then uh, transfer to uh, take a GED. Next slide, please. Summer dropouts. So that's the third, the third dropout type in there. And that's the one that that it is most likely that you're going to follow up and try to determine is the student actually a dropout. So what's going on with these kiddos is at the end of their last enrollment last year, they exited in a way that we expect them to show up again at another school or return to school this year in the same school. Uh, but they haven't, and so they are they are currently listed in there as a summer dropout. 
So um, sometimes the student did drop out during the summer, but a lot of times they didn't. There's just something going on that either needs to be updated, their exit code from last year needs to be updated, or for some reason their current year enrollment isn't getting into Utrex. And that's something sometimes that we can follow up on, or sometimes it's just a matter of being patient and waiting for validation errors to get cleared. Um, so for these students, we have the expectation that they're gonna return to school. And until they have an enrollment in the current school year in a USBE public school that has an entry date prior to October 1 and membership greater than zero, those students are going to continue to show up as a summer dropout. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a new slide this year, Utah Fits All. Um, so the Utah Fits All students taking course for work through a public school, if the public school is a UFA provider, they can't have their enrollment information sent to Utrex. And so they're going to show up as a as if they weren't hadn't returned to school because they're not going to have an enrollment record coming into Utrex with membership. So if you have a, a student who's listed as a summer dropout and you either know that they are doing UFA this year or you're you're talking to the school that you transferred the records to and that school says, yeah, we do have them enrolled. Make sure you clarify, are they a UFA student? If they are a UFA student, then the way to get them off of your dropout report is to submit an S1X record to update last year's exit code on their last enrollment record. And the exit code is either going to be transferred to private school or transferred to homeschool. And actually that second bullet point there should say TH, not TP. Um, and the whether which one of those you use, um, that's going to be a judgment call, call on on when they exit, whether they say they're primarily doing their using UFA to do homeschool work or to do or to enroll in a private school. Next slide, please. OK, so why is this important? So this is very high stakes for your LEA's special education department. So this data is used for calculating the OSEP indicator 2, which is the rate of students exiting special education by dropping out. And it's a component of your LEA's uh, special education results driven accountability risk score. So updating these codes, tracking down summer dropouts, it really helps improve data accuracy. It, it also helps ensure that no child is allowed to slip through the cracks due to enrollment tracking issues or outdated data. Uh, and then we have we have a, a webinar you can review if you want to find out more information about Indicator 2. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what we do every year in order to try to facilitate getting this data as clean as possible. So in early September, the USBE Special Education Data Analyst, that's me, looks at the event dropout report and flags either LEAs that have a large increase in their dropout count or their dropout rate compared to, or they're an LEA that doesn't have a grade 12. And if you even have a single dropout, then your indicator dropout rate, indicator two dropout rate is kind of probably going to be 100%. Um, and so we don't want to cat, want that to catch you off guard um, because it's a weird rate. You, you don't expect to have 100% dropout because you had a dropout rate because you had one kiddo dropout, right? So that's why we, that's why we reach out to those LEAs. Um, and so the special, the person who reaches out is Lavinia Gripentrog, and she's a transition specialist. And she sends that sent that email out to special education directors in early September. And we've heard back from a lot of special education directors. People have been working hard on this. Um, hopefully, that's the case in your LEA with this data. Sometimes it can take a while to to track down students to get everything updated. If you end up having to submit a historical update request, those can take a while and, and the deadline is September 23rd. So we want you getting to work on those early. So that's why we start sending out those emails in early September. And then of course, the data and statistics team begins their courtesy reviews in about mid-September. They've already started those. 
And they will also include um, a line in there about your event dropout rate. Um, I believe just if it's a if it's a high rate. Next slide, please. Okay, so then for the LEA, you need to download the report and look through it and make sure your current year data. Well, so first of all, make sure your current year data is making into Utrex. Um, clear those fatal errors as, as, as often and as early as you can. And then also importantly is make sure that you are submitting membership. Um, and then make sure that students' exit codes and high school completion status codes from the prior year are accurate. If not, if the student's enrolled in your LEA during the current year, you have to submit an, a historical update request to get last year's code updated. Um, and the deadline for that, again, is September 3rd, 23rd, so that's coming up soon. Uh, if the student isn't currently enrolled in your LEA, then you can update last year's exit code by submitting an S1X record. If the student is attending another LEA, make sure that they're using the same SSID and that their submission meets requirements. So again, that they have the student has to have membership reported and they have to have an entry date by October 1. Um, I do have a PowerPoint that goes into more depth on this that I can provide. Um, if anyone needs more information, just go ahead and email me and I'll, I'll send that out. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of the frequently asked questions that we get. So my student dropped out last year, but came back to school this year. Why are they still showing up as a dropout? So like I said before, if the if the dropout type is listed as exit code or high school completion status code, that tells us the student exited as a dropout during the 2024 school year. And returning to school in 2025 doesn't change the fact of how they exited last year, which was dropping out. So for example, a student left in January, they said, I'm dropping out. And even though they returned to school this year, which is wonderful, they were still a dropout in January of last year. The dropout exit codes are transferred to adult ed, drop out, expelled, uh, exit to take a GED, uh, graduation pending, and that's actually a high a, um, a high school completion status code. UN is unknown and WD is withdrew. Next slide, please. Okay, so a student is showing up as a summer dropout, but I verified that they returned to school this year. Why are they still showing up as a dropout? So most likely there's a problem with the data being submitted for the current school year. Um, either there's a fatal error on the enrollment record or it has zero membership or the student enrolled with another SSID. And then also now the new thing to check is make sure that they aren't a UFA student. If, if you or the school where the student is enrolled are unable to identify the problem, you can always reach out to Utrex Help for assistance. Identifying the problem, you can reach to me as well. Next slide, please. I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, I have a retained senior who is going to attend post high but changed their mind. Can I update their RT status to something else so they don't show up as a summer dropout? So the answer to this is maybe. Uh, they have to they have to meet requirements in order to to have their their status changed to some other exit code. Um, and if they do meet the requirements for one of these other exit codes, then that'll prevent them from showing up as a summer dropout. So if the student transferred to the USBE outside of the USBE system. So a student who transferred to higher ed or the um, uh, Utah technical colleges, uh, they transfer out of country, out of state or to private school. Uh, transfer to homeschool should also be listed there. Um, the student has earned a certificate of completion. The student has completed the alternate diploma. If the RT code was a mistake, the student should have been reported with a different high school completion status code, like age out, graduate with the adult ed diploma, graduate with um, a military regular diploma, or the um, or the uh, the math uh, regular diploma. 
And then finally, if a student died or withdrew for medical reasons. Next slide, please. Okay, and so if you want more information about how graduation codes are used for calculating indicator one and two, the uh, there this link here, the special education graduation, um, or sorry, this uh, link here takes you to the secondary transition transition page, uh, which has a special education um, graduation guidance document that has really detailed information to help you out on on choosing which code to use. Next slide, please. Okay, and then this is my favorite slide because I we really do see a huge difference every year and I like to celebrate that that success. Um so every year we start out in September, the dropout count is somewhere in the 2000 range and then by the time of the actual October deadline, it's usually in about the 14, 1500 student count range. Um, and so a drop of about 40 to 50% in the number of students that are being identified as, as dropouts. So we're doing a great job every year, cleaning this data up and keep up that great work. Okay, and then my next slide is about the ESSA alternate assessment 1% threshold. Next slide. So this is something that that uh, came about with the reauthorization and they required starting in school year 2018 that there's a 1% cap on the percent of students statewide who are tested with an alternate assessment. And that calculation is based on data submitted in EdFax files. For language arts and math, we submit students in grades three through 10. And for science, we submit students in grades four through 10. Next slide. Okay, so the regulation spells out that the state can't require LEAs to cap their students at 1%. That 1% cap is just on the state. Um, but the state, the LEAs that are over 1% are required to submit a justification letter to USBE. So for that process in early October, your LEA special director is going to get a notification letter if, if your LEA is over 1%. Um, and that's based on the 2024 uh, assessments. And then the due date to return the justification letter this year is going to be in November. Um, LEH, so in that letter, um, you're going to have to include, they're going to have to include alternate assessment projections for the 2025 school year. And so that's why I'm presenting this here because you might be, you might be involved, asked to be involved in, in helping to come up with, with data for this. Next slide, please. Okay, so the uh, USBE team um, is going to review each justification letter in conjunction with the December 1 child count data, and they're going to make monitoring decisions. A third of LEAs who exceed the 1% participation rate are going to be monitored. And USBE may select specific schools and students to be monitored. You'll need to show their eligibility documentation and IEPs. Um, or they'll need to be uploaded to UPIPS um, for the monitoring. And there's also going to be some on-site monitoring. So that's why this data is important. Okay, so we'll, we're asking you to work with your special ed directors to analyze current year data and calculate your projected current year alternate assessment rates for each of the subject areas and then also to collect and submit the required documentation to UPIPS. Next slide. Okay, so the uh, calculation, how it's done so that you can do it for yourself to, for projecting for next year. Um, so it's done separately for each subject area, math, science, and language arts. Um, if you want to look up the EdFax specifications, these are the um, 
uh, gosh, actually it should be, um, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess the 185, 188, 189 are the assessment participation specifications. Um, and so those would be the, the specifications you'd want to read through if, if you're interested. Um, so, but basically in the numerator, all it's all students who were tested with an alternate assessment. And in the denominator, it's all tested students. And so if they didn't take a test, they don't go in the denominator. Um, and we're talking DLM, RISE, and Utah Aspire Plus. Um, students who are opted out don't get included in the denominator. And and then one thing that's different for the English, uh, for the language arts calculation, and this doesn't apply to math or science calculations, if the student is a first year English learner, they can also be excluded from the denominator. Next slide, please. Okay, so our state alternate assessment rate. So 2018 was the first year that this was a requirement. We got notification of this before the start of the 2018 school year. And we looked at our data and we were over 1% as a state in every in every subject area. And we started working on it ahead of the year when it would be required. And it made a difference. In 2018, 2017, we were over 1% in each subject area. In 2018, we were under 1%. We've managed to stay under 1% since then but we are scarily close to getting over 1% in 2024. And we don't know what we're going to do if we get over 1%. Um, the, there's no, there's, there's no way out. There's no, um, some states are allowed to uh, request an exception to the requirement if they have a 95% participation rate among students with disabilities. And we do not. So we can't request an exception to this requirement. Next slide, please. Okay, and then, so this slide shows the number of LEAs that were over 1% in one or more subject areas. So these are the number of LEAs that had to write justification letters. And that number has usually hovered in the, the low 40 range. This year we have 50 LEAs that are gonna have to write 1% justification letters. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some resources about alternate assessments, uh, participation guidelines. We have the board rule defining a significant cognitive disability. There's also a TA document to help with that. And we have, uh, there's a link to the assessment webpage. If you have questions, you wanna reach out to someone about Tracy Gooley would be the person to reach out to. And then if you have questions uh, with, Cal doing that calculation, data that should be included in in your projections, feel free to reach out to me. Okay, any other questions before we move on to Calista and David's presentation? Okay, great, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so we uh, did the preliminary graduation rate for the 2024 uh, cohort in August uh, based off of the year-end data. Um, we sent out files with the the cohort information uh, through MoveIt. Uh, I believe it went into the assessment folder, so they should have those. The graduation rate preview report on the data gateway was, was updated and is available to use now. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> uh, the Uzi report uh, is also available and this shows you where to go. The graduation for four year report on the gateway is always available and shows multiple cohort years. Um, and then the, there's the Tableau dashboards that show the uh, prior year data. Next slide. Okay, so this gives you a little bit of background information about what the Uzi report is. If you need to 
you know, if you're, if you're interested in understanding what it, what it is, if you don't know already, <laughs> um, it's available after the July and October one finalized submissions. Um, there's just some general information for you there. Next slide. This is just some information on where to find the report, its purpose and how to use it. And then here's the contact, uh, you know, who to contact if you have questions or need help with it. The next slide. <clears throat> so to update the graduation data, um, all the, the data must be updated in Utrex by the October 1 submission deadline. And this year it's uh, Monday, October 7th. Uh, please review your, your graduation rate data uh, and make any changes that are needed. Any changes to the finalized year-end data must be made through an S1X record update or through a historical update request if the student's still enrolled in your LEA. Uh, historical updates requests are due two weeks prior to the October 1 submission, so that would be Monday, September 23rd, so that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, next slide. Graduation rate data for 24 will be run after the finalization of the October 1 submission. Um, and then we'll make it available through Move It again for, to preview that. Um, and then the graduation rate data, the finalization of that will be available in mid November and released to the public in December. The next slide. <clears throat> Here's just uh, some information on where to find the graduation rate preview report. And it shows the it shows the same data as what we had sent out through Move It, um, but it also gives an aggregate at the bottom to tell you how many are in each category. The next slide. Uh, so you can use the file to check their exit and completion status. Uh, codes. Um, every student in your file is in your cohort is being counted to your LEA. This that includes any student that enrolled at any time in the last about four years at your LEA, even if the student only attended for one year. Um, if you are the last enrollment of record, um, that's that's how the that's what the rules say that it would be applied to you. Uh, but if you if you find something that needs updating, uh, make sure that you your update is done in Utrex as well, not just in your SIS. Next slide. Uh, so use the aggregated graduation rate outcome file to check the number of dropouts, uh, graduates, compl other completers, and continuing students, and those that are excluded. <clears throat> The graduation rate outcome data is directly determined by the codes that are you that are finalized in the October one submission, and then the graduation rate data determines the the twenty twenty four graduation rate for your LEA. Next slide. Uh, the graduation rate is calculated based off of the data entered in your SIS. Um, each student who attends high school is assigned a cohort, and then uh, so the cohort is set based off of their ninth grade um, records. At the end of the student's cohort year, a student's categorized either one of you know, one of those outcomes, and a school's graduation rate is the number of graduates divided by the number of total number of students in your cohort minus those that are excluded. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, here's just some more information. I think I basic uh, went over this before, but here's some more information. Um, next slide. So each student can only be included in one school's graduation rate, and there are, we have uh, tiebreaker rules that determine which school that that it goes to. Um, End result is one enrollment record for each student chosen and counted in the final graduation rate uh, to one LEA in school. Uh, we don't count uh, records that are school of record now. Um, and in a case, if a student was enrolled in, and had a record for eighth grade and ninth grade, 
uh, in that year that the, it wouldn't trigger the the cohort. It would be a, in a year where there was just a ninth grade record, or if they started in tenth or whatever, um, that would be when it, the, it would be triggered. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, here's just some examples for you to for your reference. Next slide. Uh, and again, here's here's how the graduation rate is uh, calculated. Uh, next slide. Uh, just some more information about how the cohort. The graduation rate is calculated in the dropout rate. Next slide, please. Uh, cohort dropouts are different from single year dropouts. Um, event dropout rate is how many students who started the school year dropped out. The rate is calculated by uh, USBE. The special ed event dropout report shows single year dropouts for special ed students, and you can update prior exit codes and Utrex for event dropouts in the same way you would update cohort dropouts. Next slide. Uh, yeah, the, the slides will be sent out um, later after the meeting. So here's how to make prior updates uh, in Utrex. Um, after the year-end finalization is in July, Utrex rolls over to the new school years to update graduation data for students in the 2024 cohort that are no longer enrolled in your LEA. You must submit an S1X update record. For data that can't be updated in an S1X, you have to submit an, a historical update request through the data gateway form. If a historical update request is submitted for an update, an LEA can do with an S or can't. It can do with an S1X record update, the request will be denied. The next slide. Um, so here are some codes that will uh, turn into dropouts if they are not updated at the in the final submission in October. Next slide. These are others that could turn into dropouts. Um, if, if not updated, obviously. Um, next slide. And then these are ones that may become dropouts. These will become dropouts if the student does not re-enroll or enrolls as a school record now in another LEA after exiting with one of these codes. So this is something to also make sure you to double check. The next slide. And then here's just a list of excluded codes that would need um, documentation. Next slide. Uh, so if an LEA enrolls, if LEAs enroll UFA students in Utrex and need to exit enrollment records, they should use the TP or transfer to private or the TH or CH transfer to homeschool exit codes. Proper documentation is still required by the LEA. LEAs, when using these exit codes, uh, enrollment records exit with the TP and TH exit codes will be excluded from the event dropout and cohort graduation rates. Prior year records can be updated via the S1X update or historical updates if the student is currently enrolled with you. Next slide. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Callista now. There's no questions. Okay. Um... I will be talking about how to make updates. Um, so at this point in the year, um, if you are looking at your 2024 cohort data, the only way to update those prior year records is through um, one of two ways. Um, the first is an S1X record update and the second is historical updates. And those are, um, there are, separate circumstances that um, would dictate which one you would use. Um, so I'll go over that now. So next slide. Um, so at year end, which um, you finalized 
your data on July 7th earlier this year. Um, all of the exit codes and high school completion status codes were finalized in Utrex. Um, but after July, Utrex rolls over to a new school year. And so at that point, um, once Utrex rolls over, you can no longer update those exit codes or completion statuses just in your SIS. Um, it has to be sent with an update. Um, that way it changes in Utrex. Um, so next slide. Um, some examples of reasons that you may need to update data in Utrex on prior year records um, may include grade level inconsistencies. Um, there are actually validations on that and occasionally an LEA might get a fatal error. Um, so that's a reason that you would need to update a, a prior year record. Um, permanent exit errors are <clears throat> um, big ones that require historical updates. Um, and that's when you code a student as a graduate. Um, in a prior year, they can't re-enroll or they'll get a fatal error. And so the only way to, to update that is to remove the, the graduation code or to change it to something else. And so that requires a historical update. Um, and then <clears throat> other graduation updates, so changing codes, um, like David mentioned. All right, next slide. Um, so as was mentioned, there's two ways to do those updates. Um, next slide. Uh, the first way is through an S1X record update. Um, this is um, by far the less time consuming, easier option. Um, but of course, there are certain circumstances where the other way, a historical update, is the only way to do it. So if it can be done with an S1X, this is what um, we tell LEAs to do. And if it can't be done with an S1X, then we'll um, let you know that a historical update would be required. Um, so an S1X can update exit codes and high school completion status codes um, from a prior school year. And you would submit um, that record in the current school year with a few certain fields marked um, and I'll go over that now. Um, and then by submitting it that way in this school year, it will update the prior year. So an example might be if last year end, school year 2024, you had a student that transferred um, or you coded them as a transfer, but you realized that they actually went to homeschool. And so a way to update that is to submit um, what we call an S1X. It's basically a regular S1 record, but it's going to have an X on the resident status, which um, sends a notification in Utrex that this is updating last year's code. And you would put the new code that you want. Um, so in this case, that would be the transfer to homeschool code. Um, next slide. Um, so it's really important that that X is marked. Different SIS systems might do it a little differently, um, but the resident status needs to be marked as X. Otherwise, Utrex isn't going to know that this is an update record. Um, these cannot be used for students who are currently enrolled in your LEA. That's when a historical update would have to be done. Um, so make sure to put the X on the resident status, and then you would also just want to make sure that you only submit the student or S1 record. You wouldn't be submitting SCRAM or YSE, any other records with it, only the student record. Um, next slide. <clears throat> um, so the steps to do that, um, you would create an enrollment record the way you would normally do any other enrollment. Um, make sure it's for the, the student you're trying to update in this current school year, even though that student is not really enrolled this year, you put the X on the resident status. Um, 
it only needs to be um, set, you know, for a couple days so you can exit the student after one to two days. Um, usually LEAs will put the entry date as just the start of the school year. Um, that part isn't the important part. That We're just trying to get the record in and update the, the code. Um, the membership needs to be set at zero. And then the, the most important part, you need to put in the correct exit code and or completion status code that you're trying to update. If you do all these steps to create the record and then you don't put in the right exit code or completion status code, um, it's kind of a bummer because um, you would actually not be updating the student the way you're hoping. Um, especially if you leave those blank, um, that will actually overwrite the prior year codes to be blank, which are dropouts. So just make sure that you follow all those steps carefully. All right, next slide. Um, this is just a screenshot. I believe this is a spire um, of what it might look like in your SAS when you're trying to do the um, update record. So in Aspire, it looks on the drop down for the resident status, there's an X and it says it, that it's a change record, but that might vary across SIS systems. And we actually have collected over the years um, some how-to documents for different SISs on how to do these S1X record updates. So if you're new or if you just um, need some additional guidance, um, you can reach out to me and I can send you that for your specific SIS. Um, next slide. Okay, um, are there any questions on S1X uh, record updates? Okay. Um, if not, I'll move on to historical updates. So anything that cannot be done with an S1X um, has to be done with a historical update. Um, and so if a historical update request is sent in that can be done with an S1X, we will decline it um, because it's just easier for you and for us um, to do an S1X. But there are some cases when historical updates are the only way. Some examples of when that might be are um, updating, you know, those prior year exit and completion status codes for students that are still enrolled with you. Um, so a common example of that is when you have permanent exit errors, students that um, you thought were graduating at year end and then they ended up re-enrolling and they actually need to be retained. Um, so in that situation, you would need to do a historical update. Other examples of when you might use a historical update would be incorrect grade level. Um, you can't update grade level with an S1X. Um, so those have to be done with a historical update. And it's not just for high school graduation students. It's any grade level change, um, even if the student's in kindergarten. If there's an incorrect grade level submitted in Utrex, it would have to be corrected with a historical update um, if it's on a prior year record. Um, a couple other examples of when to use a historical update. I already talked about those level two fatal error. Oh, sorry, this is a different level two fatal error. Um, so this is when you have grade level um, inconsistencies, but when it's two grades or more, then it will trigger a fatal error. And the only way to remove that is through um, an exception to that validation. And so you would request that with a historical update. Um, this one is very rare, but if there's ever um, a request to change a cohort year, um, some examples of when this happens is if um, a student comes from out of the country and 
after enrolling, you find out that they actually already graduated. Um, or perhaps there's a major grade level data entry error on the student and so that affects their cohort. Um, it doesn't happen very often at all and we actually have to get those approved um, by Aaron and kind of do some investigation in order to approve those. Um, and then lastly, any legal name or sex changes, we see these every year. Um, it does have to be a legal change that occurred on a birth certificate. Um, those, the only way to update those are through a historical update. Okay, next slide. Um, this just shows you if you were going to do a historical update, how you would do this. So you do have to, um, I believe have the LEA admin role um, to be able to submit these. And so it's in Data Gateway, you log in, and then in the Utrex dropdown, you, if you had that role, um, you would see the historical update on the dropdown. And then you would go ahead and start a new request um, and make sure to fill out everything very thoroughly. We have to review these on a one by one basis. It takes a lot of time. So um, the more information you can provide, the better so we can um, avoid having to go back and forth asking more questions. Um, next slide. Um, so this is what the new request would look like. There's a lot of information that you would need to fill out. Um, in the case where another LEA might be involved, we just ask that um, you work with the other LEA so that both of you are aware that this update is being requested um, and that you can provide all of the school numbers, student information, um, any things that will help us to decide if this is something we can approve. Um, next slide. Um, as has been mentioned before, um, these are manual requests. Um, and so it takes a lot of time and it takes multiple teams to be able to complete these. So we set the deadline to two weeks prior to the submission deadline. Um, and we say that that's for a guaranteed completion, meaning if you get those in, it's this Monday is the deadline. Um, we guarantee that those will get done in time for the October 7th finalized um, deadline. You can submit them after Monday. Um, we just can't promise that they will get done. We will try our best. Um, so you can keep submitting them, but we just, we don't guarantee anything after Monday. Um, this is a really common question that we get. So once you've submitted the request, you will get an email from the system saying that it was approved. Um, but just know that doesn't mean that it has been completed. So if you submitted a historical update on the student that has a fatal error, the fatal error is going to stay on the student until you are notified that the request was actually complete. So you will get two emails. One will say it's approved, and then you have to wait till you get a second email that says it's actually been completed. Um, and that can take weeks. And so this is why um, we do not approve any historical updates that can be done with an S1X because these are very, um, take a lot of time. Um, again, you can expect that it will be complete before October 7th. Um, and I can say currently, um, if you sent in a request in the last few weeks, or I guess since, August. Um, those ones are just now in the stages of being worked on um, at the IT level. So those ones should be rolled out in the next two weeks, um, or sorry, one week. Um, 
So if you had a request in that you're waiting on that's been approved, um, I would say you can expect that in the next week to get done. Again, you'll get an email notification. There's a second round that may not get done until close to the deadline. Um, so that that would be requests that have been put in, in probably this week. Um, but you can always reach out to me if you want to check on the time frame of those. Um, just know that um, once a historical update um, is completed, if it's on a student that has a fatal error and you've already finalized, you would um, need to refinalize. Uh, next slide. And that's kind of what this slide is talking about. So if you're in the boat where you're waiting on your last few historical updates to get done, and you're trying to decide if you want to finalize or not, um, updates that are needed to clear fatal errors um, mean that those students are not going to get into UTREX unless they're done. So you either need to wait to finalize till you've been notified that the historical update's completed, or you can finalize and just refinalize after those have been completed. Um, any historical updates, though, that are not causing fatal errors, um, you can go ahead and finalize um, because those won't impact the students getting into UTREX. Those are just manual changes um, that won't affect your October 1 submission. Okay, any questions on that? All right, next slide. Um, if you do think of questions later on, um, you can contact David or myself directly and we actually prefer that you reach out to us before putting in historical updates if you're not sure, just because um, it will save both you and us a lot of time if we can help clear up any confusion about whether you should put it in or how to put it in. So also, if you want to um, check on any S1X record updates to see if those are actually going through correctly, you can also reach out to us for that. Um, all right, and you can go on to the next presentation. Okay, so this is also me along with Riley and Stephanie. Um, so this is for the October 1 finalized submission. Um, it has been talked about by Aaron. The deadline this year is October 7th, um, but there are no extensions. Um, next slide. Okay, and I'll turn the time over to Riley. All right, so these are just some brief um, announcements and some of them have been covered. So uh, we might sound like a broken record, but we are trying to ensure that everyone is clear. So the deadline for October 1 um, was changed to October 5, but this year it still falls on October 7th because October 5th is on a weekend. And so the deadline is Monday, October 7th at 5 p.m. The historical updates are due two weeks before the deadline, which is this coming Monday at 5 p.m. There are no extensions for the October 1 submission this school year, and please plan accordingly to get your data submitted and finalized um, as correctly as possible. Um, some other Overall announcements is that the S1.368 validation, which is district of residence must not be blank, is now fatal for districts and charters. Um, the level two invalid address and level two invalid district of residence validations are staying as warnings for all LEAs in October and December. So again, the deadline is October 5th at 5 p.m. The goal is for the finalizer to be turned on starting Monday, September 30th, and will be turned off on Monday, October 7th. And um, you can finalize before October 1 if the finalize button is available, only if you don't have any changes in enrollment between the day you finalize and October 1. Otherwise, you'll need to refinalize. Um, the submission is for data as of October 1, so it doesn't matter the day of the week that October 1 falls on. It's the entry and exit dates that determine if the student makes it into the October 1 count. 
and there's some bit of details and code underneath. So after the October 1 data are finalized, uh, you do not need to delete your submissions after your finalization is done, and future submissions will not overwrite your finalized data unless you finalize again. Um, and given that there are no extensions this fall, um, there is a strategy that some LEAs use where, you know, once they get a clean submission in, they finalize their data and then they continue to work on um, making any changes to the data and then continue to refinalize because you can finalize as many times as you want up until the deadline. Um, but after you're done finalizing, um, download all of your October 1 UTREX reports from the data gateway immediately after you finalize and Stephanie will show you how to do that. Uh, the link that goes to the finalized reports in the finalized dialog box directs you to archive reports and those aren't available immediately. So you need to go to uh, the non-archived reports and access them there. So we'll be sending out um, courtesy reviews soon. So uh, the data and statistics team reviews data and looks at some points. And we also um, request that all LEAs look over their own data. And these are some um, of the points that are important to look at. Uh, district of residence and valid address errors, SSID warnings, total enrollment counts, kindergarten type counts. This is something that um, we really need to make sure people are paying attention to. Um, last year, there were some issues with that. And so um, just ensure that you're submitting the right counts, um, right types for your kindergartners. The count of foreign exchange students, um, economically disadvantaged or free and reduced lunch indicators, English learner counts, cohort grad rate data, cohort reassignment for students on a path to an alternate diploma, and special ed event dropout data. So for clearing fatal errors, please review all errors and warnings and clear what is possible. And it's especially important to pay attention to fatal errors that block student enrollment records from getting into UTREX, which include level one er fatal errors on the student record, student list, school and district record. So if, it's, if a fatal error is blocking all the data for school or district data from getting into UTREX, that's not good. Um, and then level one fatal errors on course records, that will have to be fixed um, if they result in the S1.377 error. Some more fatal errors that need to be cleared, all level two fatal errors, uh, including permanent exit, student grade level inconsistency, dual scram, dual kindergarten, and um, you just need to work with the other LEA and the student's parents to determine which LEA should keep the student and which LEA should unenroll the student. And to clear the fatal error, the overlap in kindergarten records needs to be less than 20 days. Uh, level two warnings that must be fixed for October 1. So there's valid address warning and uh, Cliff shared about this earlier, but you can clear this by using one of the three new optional address fields, which are GPS latitude, GPS longitude, and geocode. Um, as he also mentioned, you can temporarily use the student physical address one and enter um, those alternate methods there. Um, this next thing that I'm going to say is different than what we said last month, because at the time the plan was for the warning to turn fatal. Um, given that it's not turning fatal, charters are still required to clear these level two warnings. And so you can clear them by using the three new optional fields, or this time you are allowed to contact Sam Uri, um, if the above does not work. Uh, and then the district of residence warning, the way that you clear that is to make sure the address is validated and fix the district of residence. There are SSID warnings that um, also need to be cleared, so please review SSIDs carefully to avoid problems related to students having more than one SSID or more than one student sharing an SSID. And if you find um, duplicate SSID issues, put in a merge request as soon as possible um, because they take a while to complete and their manual process similar to historical updates. And you can uh, submit these 
through the help desk. And then for October 1 total enrollment counts, um, you might be asking, you might be wondering who is included in my October 1 enrollment count. There are specific requirements. Students have to be in grades kindergarten through 12. They have to have at least one day of membership. They have to be a Utah resident, which means a resident status of B, C, or U. And they also have to have an active enrollment record as of October 1, and their school of record cannot be no. And these counts are important because they determine funding for your LEA. And then school counts as well. Uh, you need to make sure that school counts are correct for school year 2024 and 2025. So um, check to see that the new schools are included in your school summary report. It's better to catch and fix this now rather than at your end. And you can email our team or put in a help desk ticket if you find any missing schools. And these um, reports are used for audit and funding purposes. So it's important to have these um, correct. All right, I'll hand this off to Calista. Okay, um, so other counts that we look at when we're doing the courtesy data reviews and that we encourage you to be looking at before you finalize is um, demographic counts, which includes English learner counts and then your economically disadvantaged counts. Um, the reason is because um, that data that's finalized in October for both of those um, two counts are used for funding purposes. And so they do need to be right in October. Um, and this year it's especially critical to get those right because we're not doing extensions. So if for some reason, you know, you finalized without your English learner count, um, that's going to have some bad consequences for your LEA. Um, the what we do when we um, look at those counts is that we look at what you finalized last year in October and compare that to what's in Utrex this year. Um, and if we see obvious, you know, there's a zero this year and last year you had a count, we'll flag that or big changes, um, whether that's increases or decreases. Um, it may be correct what you have in Utrex, but we just ask that you still review it. Um, so just because we flag it on your review, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, it just looks like a big enough change that we think you should review it. Next slide. Um, this is really important now um, because it prior to um, to last year, this was something that we only reviewed at year end, um, but now this needs to be correct in October and it's your kindergarten type counts. Last year, we actually did not um, review this in the courtesy data reviews. And so LEA is finalized with incorrect kindergarten type counts. And so we ended up having to do a Qualtrics survey for those that were um, in this position last year and might remember. Um, so this year it needs to be right in Utrex. Um, and so we will be including this on the courtesy data review. And um, the big thing to check for this is that your full day and half day codes, which full day is the FN code and half day is the NN code um, for kindergarten type, that those are correct. And the reason that those need to be correct is because they're tied directly to funding. Um, and so this um, second bullet point is directly from the Utrecht specifications, but um, these counts, what you finalize in October are used for WPU <clears throat> um, funding on these students. So students with um, the NN or half day code will receive 55% of their average daily membership. Um, while students with the full day um, code FN will be funded at 100%. So um, if you do the math, that's a lot of money to lose if you accidentally report your kindergartners as half day when they should have been full day. 
Um, and again, there's no extensions this year, so it needs to be correct when you finalize. Um, next slide. Oh, and sorry, one more note on the kindergarten type um, counts. I know that in the past, I don't know if this has changed, Paula can speak to this, but in some SIS systems like Aspire, um, the, the system would default the student record to being half day. Um, and so you would have to manually go in and change the student if they were full day. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, but that's just something to be aware of. Oh, Paula said now the default is full day. Um, so that's good to know. But just be careful um, when you create those student records for kindergartners, make sure that they are coded correctly if they're full day or half day. Um, Foreign exchange student counts, this is something we've always reviewed. Um, the reason that we look at this is because um, students that are reported with the J resident status, um, they receive funding from a separate program at USPE for foreign exchange students um, and will not be included in your October 1 count funding. So there, every um, LEA that is receiving an allocation for foreign exchange students, um, it would be expected that your count would match what you're being allocated for. So that's what we're looking at. Um, if for some reason you report other students with that J status, um, you may miss out on any funding if, if they're not supposed to be reported that way. So um, that's what we look at when we review um, foreign exchange students. Next slide. Hey, Calista, we've got a question oh, in the chat. Yes. Sorry. About SSID fatals. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, that might be a cliff question. Um, so if you don't mind, we might get back to that. Um, I don't know if Cliff, Cliff, are you still on? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, in general, I know that when you make changes, um, if you've had fatal errors, I don't know for sure with the SSID system, I would think that it would take overnight, um, but you do have to resubmit with your changes, um, not only in your SIS, but to Utrex. And so a lot of times we just tell people to look the next day. I don't know if you've already done that and it's been longer than that. Um, but usually that's the general timing is to just wait till the next day and to see if those have cleared at that point. All right, um, Malia already talked about this in depth, so I won't spend too much time on it. We do um, look at special ed event dropout counts when we do courtesy data reviews. We will generally just um, flag it if you have a big increase from last year. Um, and as was already mentioned, the reason for that is because those students will be reported to OSEP. Um, for the indicator two. So um, there is a specific report you can review um, the student level data on for these, and it's in your Utrex October reports. It's the dropout event summary SPED report. Um, next slide. Okay, this is another um, special ed data point that we look at um, in October. The reason is because this isn't necessarily something that's funded in October, but it will be funded in December, and these counts are really important in December. And so we just start looking at it now so that LEAs can start um, getting the data right now rather than wait till December. And so this is your um, is 1% student counts. Um, so we will flag if you have a zero count when you did have um, 1% students last year. 
Um, we'll also look if there's a big change um, um, comparing last year at this time to this year. Um, and again, this is just in preparation for when it needs to be right in the December submission um, because it is related to funding. Um, Next slide. Oh, sorry. There's no, there's no funding on for is one percent. Um, it's it uh, lets us know if the student is eligible for. Um, it gets them rostered for DLM, and it lets us know if they're eligible for essential elements courses or if they're eligible for other alternate assessments, and as well as working toward the alternate diploma. And we do use it from the October data for making those monitoring decisions. So it's it's not just getting ready for December. It's we need it accurate in October. Okay, thanks, Malia, for that. Um, yeah, we can get that updated on this slide as well. So um, yes, thank you for correcting me on that one. All right, next slide. Um, this was already talked about in depth as well, but we will also look at your cohort graduation data. Um, this is, again, super important for October because um, whatever updates are finalized in the October submission, that's it. We can't, um, after, for the 2024 cohort, um, we can't um, make changes after after October 1's mission is finalized. So um, please, please, please review um, the 2024 cohort students. And there's two places you can look in the Move It files that were sent. Um, if you don't have access to that, you can look on the graduation rate pre preview report on Data Gateway. Um, you do have to have the right role to see that report. So if that's something that um, you should be looking at and you can't see that for some reason, you can reach out um, either through a help desk ticket or to data and statistics, and we can look at giving you the right role to be able to view that report. Um, but all students on that report are going to be counted to your LEA. So it's important that you review those um, and if there are students that need to be updated, that you get those done um, and finalized when you do your October 1 data. Um, if there are students that have to be updated through a historical update, the deadline is Monday. And again, that's for a guaranteed completion. Um, and please reach out to me if you're not sure if you should do a historical update or not. Um, Otherwise, you can do an S1X record update. Uh, next slide. Um, this um, item is related to the um, graduation rate data. It's um, not going to affect everyone, but um, any LEA that has students who were coded as RA or um, who have students that could be coded as RA, this is important to review. Um, I do want to make a note that I sent some emails this week. It's only um, a few LEAs that would have received this email and they were, I'm pretty sure all districts. But um, we look at students that were uh, reported as RA in the 2023 school year. Um, because that means that they were reassigned to the 2024 cohort. Um, and we look at what um, happened after they were reassigned, so how they were coded. Um, the emails that were sent out this week to a few districts, um, and it would have come directly from me, um, regarding these RA students that um, potentially could become dropouts, um, there were some issues with how we identified those students. So this, again, is not going to affect most of you, but if you're in that boat, um, I will be resending um, uh, 
emails to those that were affected. Um, anyway, so I'll reach out with clarification on that. But generally what we're looking at is students that were coded as RA in 2023 and then didn't have the RA code or GA code in 2024. Um, RA students do have a reassigned cohort, so it gives them an extra year. Um, so for students that were given the RA code in 2024, they would be reassigned to the 2025 cohort. Um, it's important to get this right because uh, retained or RT coded students, they will have a different graduation outcome than RA coded students. It's an other completer versus um, or sorry, RT would be a continuing student in the four-year cohort, whereas RA would have their cohort completely reassigned so they could count as a graduate potentially. Um, the other completer versus graduate is for those that were RA and had their cohort reassigned, but then were given the GR code versus the GA code. Um, so if you have any questions on this, Malia, um, is the special education data specialist. You can reach out to her. You can also reach out to our team. We can try and help you with these. Again, there are not a ton of these, but we want to make sure that um, the students that could be coded as RA, you know that there's that option. Um, the, the requirements to use the RA code are students that are flagged as is 1% on their SCRAM record. And they also have to be on path to receive the alternate diploma. And Calissa, if I could yeah. jump in for a second. Yes. Um, so when we looked at um, updating the query to, to more accurately pull the data, it ended up there's, I think there's only four LEAs that have students that um, are in this, in this group that, um, and no LEA had more than two students. So it's, it was seven students statewide. So it's very, very, very low impact information that she just talked about. So um, if you're if you're panicking, wondering, oh, do I have any of these students? M majority of you, you do not. Um, just just uh, wait and see if you get that email from Calista saying you're one of those four LEAs. Or feel free to reach out to me if you're wondering and I can tell you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, and then kind of shifting gears. Um, so the stuff that Riley first talked about and then these other items that I mentioned, these are all what we consider must respond items, either due to um, the impact of the data on reporting or how they relate to funding. Um, and so those would be on the top section of your courtesy data review letter. Um, now we're talking about items that are still important and should be reviewed, um, but we refer to them as non-respond items, meaning you should review them, but you don't necessarily have to respond to us about it. Um, and so the first um, item that would be on this bottom section of the letter is um, ch charter students who are reported with the resident status code of C or B. Um, and that's just because we want those codes to be used correctly for data quality purposes. Um, so the C code should only be used by students, district of residence. The B code should not be used for students in charters. Um, and you can find more information about that in the Utrecht specifications. Um, we also just check um, any students who are reported with a resident status of A or F. Um, and that is because those students are not going to be in your October 1 count um, for funding. So it could be correct that you have an um, A is out of state and F is another foreign exchange um, resident status code. So we're not saying it's wrong. We just want you to double check those because, again, you're not going to get um, funding on those students. Next slide. 
Um, other non-respond items, but that you should still review. Um, for LEAs that do have graduation rates and event dropout rate data, um, you just want to check that you're submitting um, S1X records correctly. Um, so we will pull on the day that we do your data review um, a count of all the S1X records you're currently submitting. And we just want you to see if that's what you're expecting. Um, if you're submitting zero and you know that you have students that need to be updated, then you might need to take a look at that. Um, and just to note, if you are submitting S1X records, please make sure that you continue submitting those up until you finalize your data, because it would be a bummer if you have created those records and then you don't um, keep submitting them in your finalized data set, because um, those do need to get into Utrex um, when you finalize your October data. Uh, next slide. All right. I will go ahead and turn the time over to Stephanie. OK, so here are some examples we will put on your courtesy data review letter uh, for you to verify. Basically, we usually point out some dramatic change for the numbers of the student for the items that we reviewed by comparing to your last year's data at the same time. So here are some examples you can read them then how are we going to write it? Um, next slide, please. Um, so don't forget to use the examine file. Um, so to check if data, if your student data uh, made into the uh, U tracks, uh, you can download the exam data file and to, to uh, take a look. So there is the icon on the U tracks overview screen under your level one fatal error and the warnings. So if you click that up and download the file, it is the Excel spreadsheet showing you all the student level data. So you can see um, all the records currently made into the U tracks, how they looks like. And you can also check um, whatever information um, uh, that you need. And you can also filter on the record to check, um, you know, um, the S1X record update, um, you can just go to the student tab. There is multiple tabs you can check on, but in the student data tab, you can filter on a resident status uh, by X and look for the student current school year record uh, to see if the update, uh, to see if the code uh, has been updated. Next slide, please. Okay, here is uh, uh, some instruction about how to use your uh, download and use your October 1 Utrex report. Uh, multiple spots on the data gateway, you can download the reports, but one uh, way, it, one most popular way is you go to the data gateway reports for your LEA and find the October reports. This is very important because um, in the report, uh, on the report, a web page, um, different sessions listed, you know, the reports for different, um, uh, for different months. So for this uh, data review, you want to find the October reports and download all reports uh, listed under it. Um, so there are two purposes for downloading these uh, reports. One of the purposes is to review your data um, and make sure it's accurate before you finalize them. Um, so if you, um, it's, it's much more easier to sort uh, student level data in the CSV file or the PDF um, shows the aggregate if you want to find some aggregate data by schools. Um, the other purpose of it is to um, um, use the reports for official uh, official purpose and uh, analyze. So um, you download the, the, the October 1 reports is because those reports will um, disappear after you finalize your data and will uh, show up 
months later uh, if you want to find them. So always remember to download them before they disappeared. Um, next slide, please. Okay, here is some screenshot to show you uh, where the reports are um, and then uh, how to download it. Next slide, please. Okay, after you click the report on your top menu, you can see the October report is on the left top and there are some um, report that you want to download it. And also there's another report uh, which is the uh, student summary under the year round reports. That's the only one you probably want to download um, under the other um, list. Okay, next slide, please. So data and stats will send a courtesy data review to every LEA, no matter you request it or not. So we will start doing it uh, from tomorrow through the end of next week. Um, after you receive the first uh, courtesy data review, if you want additional reviews to make sure your data accuracy, you can always email us before the deadline. Um, the purpose of the courtesy data review letter is to help you to improve the data accuracy so that you can receive the correct funding and to ensure on-time submission finalization. Um, next slide, please. Some tips for a final submission. So um, don't wait until the last day or last minute to finalize because you will experience a very rush hour, everybody finalizing at the last minute. And uh, that'll be like, you will expect a extreme longer time uh, for the submitting process. And if you have some thing, you know, some error message, or if you found something, you final finalize the wrong, you want to refinalize it, you wouldn't have time to do that. And also make sure to review your data thoroughly we're here to assist LEAs in reviewing your data, but you should be um, the um, only one to responsible for your data um, to make sure they're accurate before you finalize them. Refer to the item notice, note, noted in the courtesy data review letter. So please make sure you read the um, data review, courtesy data review data and uh, verify all the data points that we pointed out. Um, also some other data points that you, you want to um, check or make sure it's accurate, uh, it's, 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 uh, accurate. Um, finalize when you are ready. You don't need our permission to finalize. So basically we're going to notify you when you are ready to finalize. Uh, when the finalized button is showing up on your LEA dashboard on Data Gateway. So after you receive that email and you see the button is available, uh, feel free to finalize it anytime. Also, uh, if you don't feel the um, finalization was correct or if you want to improve your data in later submission, you can always refinalize and refinalize it as much as you can um, until the deadline. And make sure your data collection has completed before you hit the finalize button. If you um, hit the button during the data collection, that will um, have a serious impact on the data quality uh, for your data finalization. So make sure uh, you get a completed status and you see there's a timestamp um, okay, the, the state has already received your data and your data collection has been done. Always make sure that and then submit, uh, finalize your data. Again, we want you to download all the October 1st reports for your records and for future audits right after you finalize your data. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some notes for um, historical update. Um, if your histo historical update related to um, fatal errors, you wanted to do that um, before finalizing, 
uh, so that the student record can be included in your finalized submission. So uh, the deadline for this kind of uh, historical update is Monday, um, 23rd September. Uh, for the historical update, that's not, you know, related to the fatal era, but that's related to some uh, graduation rate or even job out rate, which um, um, you can complete uh, before rate are calculated. So you don't need to uh, rush submit them by uh, next Monday. Um, so you, you can just wait a little bit and uh, just make sure you submit them before the rate calculated. Um, so proof the updates will be completed by October 7. But if you are waiting for a historic update that's not affect the fatal error, you uh, want to finalize between October, um, you know, you wanna finalize before the October 7, that is totally okay. Next slide, please. Here are some resources. You can get some technical help with the data submission, or you uh, you want to get help with issues in your SSS, or you want to get help from data and stats. Uh, here are some resources that you can uh, contact with or take a look at that them. So um, that's basically um, yet, I believe. Next slide. Yes, that's all for this presentation. Um, I'll give it back to Calista or Nicole uh, if you guys have further announcement before we um, call, it, call it a day. I think that's it. So um, unless there's any questions, um... Thanks everyone for coming and um, please keep an eye out for the courtesy data reviews coming up soon. Thanks, bye.